Good morning and welcome to our service on this Boxing Day, 26th of December. I hope you all had a lovely day yesterday. And today, Sunday, a day of worship, just as yesterday should have been. Today we're thinking about Jesus being presented at the temple and the message that the priest had for Mary, quite significant, especially in the light of our salvation. So we're going to be reading Luke 3. Before that, though, let's do what we came here to do, and that's worship the Lord. Let's sing, come and join the celebration. And if you just bear with me while I negotiate the IT. Enthusiastic there, huh? Eh? Yay, shout at the end. Quite right, too. If we can't have fun when worshipping our Lord, then there's something wrong. Let's quiet ourselves. Let's come to God in prayer. Let's pray. Lord and giver of all good things, the Magi travelled for miles to bring the Christ child the first Christmas presents. So may we too remember with thankful hearts the love that comes with each present we've received. We also thank you for the love that you have for each of us. And we thank you for the many gifts that you've given us, Lord, especially the most precious gift of all, Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Lord, now that our Christmas celebrations are past, we acknowledge that the real work of Christmas begins for each of us. Through Christ, you have helped us to love the lost, to heal those broken in spirit, to feed the hungry and release the oppressed, to bring peace among all people, and to praise you as part of our daily routine, and to radiate the light of Christ, every day and every way in all that we do and all that we are. Lead us and equip us for the work that you've called us to in Jesus' name. Jesus, who taught us to pray these words together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen indeed. We're going to watch a, a small video. 
a short video called The Gift. And let's see what this video says to us. I think it's wonderful. It just reinforces what Christmas is all about. The Gift. Auntie, what do you got there? A present. These weren't here yesterday. For the chains and the door. What chains? What am I supposed to do with these it? chains? Oh, we can see them, Michael. You're not fooling anyone. We all have them. <laughs> chains? What, you mean these accessories? <laughs> they look great. Well, they feel great and they complete the outfit. That's for sure. <laughs> and the door? What, they want us to leave? Uh, was someone complaining about the food or the comfort? The money, the opportunity. Uh, and the drink. <laughs> Paul, come on. You of all people couldn't want to leave here. There's no telling what they'd think about you out there. The drink. It's just... Maybe I can just undo the chain. You know the rules. You can't stay here if you don't keep the chains. It's what he said. Well, it's settled. No chains, no pleasure. I'm staying right here. Stay here? Look at us, we are literally in chains. You've never once wondered that maybe there's more than money and croissants? Of course there's more. More money, more things, and more happiness. It's all right here. Happiness? Really? Michael, are you happy? Yeah. I'm getting there. Getting there? Yes. I, I have a few more payouts coming and I will finally... Finally what? Be as rich as him? Ramsey, how happy are you? Michael. What, Sarah? I'm not leaving. I've just about got enough to make... Well, will that be enough? Or will it be the next thing, and the next, and the next? Yes, it will be enough, Sarah. I just need a little more Maybe time. we should use the key to get rid of these chains. Well, I like these chains! Besides, we can always open the box later, right? What if we don't get that chance? Remember Tim and Alicia and Rose? Stop. That's not going to happen. You don't know that. Your money couldn't save her, and how can it save you? Look, if you want to leave so badly, why don't you just go? Well, it's not that simple. I can't just leave. I don't know about you, but I found that quite thought-provoking, quite unsettling, because we all like money, don't we? You know, we speak about, you know, the heavenly kingdom, but, and we speak about how, how things down here are difficult on earth, but we get comfortable, don't we? What do we have to give up to make room, more room for God? What do we have to give up to make sure we have eternal life? Where are our chains? 
Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 22 to 35. Let's listen to God's word. Luke 2, 22 to 35. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's mother and father marveled, marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Amen. What are we to make of this? Well, we'll meet Simeon in a minute. Simeon will be with us in a minute to explain. Until then, let's sing together that beautiful Christmas carol, one of my favourites in the bleak midwinter. And let's pay attention to the fourth verse. That's the important one.
beautiful, a beautiful hymn. What can I give him, poor as I am? Give him my heart. And it's that note, almost at the heart of the gospel message. <laughs> Going to do a wee bit acting. Uh, don't be looking for Oscars here. I'm going to play the part of Simeon and try and explain this odd scripture. My name is Simeon, and I'm an old man, and after today, I'm ready to die. I feel ready to die as I've never been before. You see, earlier today in the temple in Jerusalem, I met a young couple who'd come with their young son for the ritual of purification. I knew when I saw them that a promise God had made to me had been fulfilled. So now I'm ready to die. There's nothing left. I'm happy and I'm satisfied. Let me explain. As I said, my name is Simeon and I'm a rabbi. In fact, I'm a member of the Sanhedrin, one of the 70 men charged with the oversight of the Jewish faith throughout the world. I'm quite important, you know. We're responsible for the purity of our religion and people look to us for guidance concerning true and false teaching. We were ordained by God to keep the faith in the face of hostile and sometimes an unbelieving world. It's a grave task, but one which every one of us is pleased and honored to undertake. You know, although can, there can be differences among us in the Sanhedrin, we all have one thing in common. We all hope for a Messiah. Every Jew is looking for the coming of the one who will unite God's people under one banner. But saying that, we all have differences ourselves about this Messiah. Some of my friends are looking for a, a military leader to rid us of these Romans that occupy our land. They are a pain, I tell you with their taxes and their orders. Just the fact they're occupying our land is an offence. So some of our friends want a mighty warrior. There have been some in the past who they thought were the Messiah. The greatest among them was our father, David. It was he who united us as a nation to stand against our ancient enemies and lead us up to victory after victory in battles against them. Ever since David, we've looked for others who could do what he did, for he was a mighty warrior. As time went on, you know, we were blessed with good and successful kings, but none quite measured up to, to David. They all were sadly lacking when compared to David. You know, our dream of the Messiah never quite came true for us, which is difficult. Then there are the zealots. They still hold on to that dream, despite the fact that no one has sat in David's throne for centuries. They say that a leader will one day rise up and overthrow all the foreign powers within, the, within our borders. There'll be a new David. They claim it's just a matter of time. But, you know, I've come to the conclusion that God's plan for his people no longer involves military might and conquest. I've began to look for a different kind of Messiah, one that will deliver us, not just in this life, but through all eternity. You know, some of my brethren may be disappointed at such a Messiah because they want a commander of armies. They want somebody who's strong and mighty. I've been convinced that our Messiah will save us from a far greater danger than our, our earthly enemies. And that's why today has been so special for me. I met that new Messiah. Indeed, I held him in my arms. I'd come into the temple courts to pray. And as I walked through the courts of women on my way to the court of Israel, a couple walking together caught my eye. An infant child was in the mother's arms, and something compelled me to walk over to them. They told me that they were from Nazareth in Galilee, and they'd come down to Jerusalem for the ritual purification 
as required for the Torah. I think they'd been in Bethlehem for a few days for the census before that. But they'd come from Galilee. That was their hometown. And they wanted their infant purified. You know, I smiled at the baby. A most handsome child with jet black hair and, and deep brown eyes. I think all babies are beautiful, but as I stood there admiring him, his parents went on to tell me that they'd named him Jesus. Not an uncommon name in our day, but the name means salvation. And many a proud parent has named their firstborn son Jesus, hoping that he might be the one to deliver our nation. But as I stood there listening to them, a voice inside me, clear as I'm speaking to you, a voice inside me said, this is he. This is he. I gestured with my eyes and my hands that I'd like to take the baby in my arms. And the woman smiled at me and handed him over. And I looked down into these deep brown eyes and felt his little arms as they waved back and forth. Suddenly I remembered why I'd come to the temple in the first place, to pray. And I felt like praying right then. I lifted my eyes to the heavens. And I prayed the most joyful prayer. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. <laughs> I just stood there for a moment, my eyes still fixed on heaven above. It was as if I, as if I was a slave who'd just been told by my master that I was a free man. I was ready to be freed. I felt free. Tell the truth, I was ready to die there and there. There was nothing left to live for. I'd seen the Messiah. I was ready to meet my God face to face. Indeed, strangely enough, as I looked into this baby's face, it was as if I was seeing my God face to face. Then I looked back down towards the child and finally over to his parents. They were staring at me, not knowing quite what to make of what I'd said. And so I smiled gently at them. I wanted to give this couple a blessing for them and for their son. So I handed the baby back to his mother. As she took him from me, I felt compelled to say something further. I would have loved to let my conversation end with the blessing, but there was something inside me that led to share my feelings. I looked at the young woman and said, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel. This child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel. Even though God hadn't specifically revealed it to me, I knew that this child would be different. A different kind of Messiah that many were expecting. This child, as a man, would lead gently, not with an army. He would teach rather than demand. He would heal rather than destroy. There'd be many of our countrymen who wouldn't be able to accept that. This poor child, though his aim was to bring peace, he would actually bring the sword. I knew too that that young mother would someday, someday be hurt by something more deeply than anyone can imagine. Not by her son, but by what others would do to her son. Please understand me. I'm not making myself out to be a fortune teller. I couldn't possibly know the details of this young family's future life. But somehow I knew their path would not be strewn with roses. They wouldn't have an easy time. And I felt led to warn them. I'm not sure if they understood because 
right at that moment, the prophetess Anna came up to see us. And she too began saying the same things about this child being the salvation of Israel. If the boy's parents had any doubts about the truth of what I'd said before, Anna most certainly removed them. As the Torah says, our, our Bible, our Jewish Bible, two witnesses are needed to confirm a report. And now two witnesses had spoken. <laughs> Within a moment, the young family had made its way out of the temple precincts. And I was left alone to gather my thoughts. And boy, did they need gathering. I wanted to say more, but it's probably just as well there was no opportunity. I don't know what I would have said, so I made my way into the inner court and began my prayers. Prayers of thanksgiving like none had ever been said before by me. So I've met the Messiah. I've met this boy, baby, this Jesus, and he is my Messiah. So I'm ready to die and go to God. I've lived a long and full life, and now I'm at complete and utter peace with God. How could be otherwise with the way God has honoured me today? Jesus, the Messiah, is born. May we worship Christ. Amen. <laughs> Told you, no Oscars. No Oscars. Not to lie. Let's have a, a short prayer. And we'll pray for people less fortunate than ourselves today. King of Kings, we join the angels in singing your unending prayer. You alone created the universe in all of its glory. And so, Lord, we present ourselves as gifts, asking that you transform our gifts and our efforts into ministries of good news. Lord, we thank you for the gift of the Messiah, the child who came to give us the gift of eternal life. Bless us, and may we honour your glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, the Messiah. Lord, we pray for many people who will be on their own today, those who've lost loved ones, those for whom yesterday brought a mixed blessing. Families sitting around their table with a place set but empty. People who don't know they're loved. Maybe they're unloved. Maybe they have no one to love them. People for whom yesterday was just another day to walk the streets waiting for night shelters to open. No presents to open. No one to wish them happy Christmas. Just another night of being homeless. And we pray for those, Lord, who, well, Christmas dinner was just another day, another, another meal, because they have no food. The food they have, they have to get from food banks. No turkeys. Just whatever they have every day. Not very much. Lord, in a, a nation where there's so much wealth, I think we're the seventh wealthiest nation in the world, help us to live in a way that brings about a more equitable society. Help us look out for those on their own, that they may no longer be unloved. And may we walk our streets with no homeless, because everybody's house, everybody has a place. Now, Lord, we'll just take a moment in silence to make our own prayers to you for people known to us who are in need of your touch or your healing. Hear our prayers. Lord, we offer our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, who loved us so much, he gave his life for us. 
Amen. It's been good to be with you today. Uh, unfortunately, I can't be with you in person because I'm at Thornley Bank today. It's Sunday and we have a service. Not to worry, tomorrow's a day off. <laughs> Actually, uh, I, I, I sometimes wonder when I meet my colleagues and they complain about what they do, their job, because this is a wonderful job. I know because I've had another one before it and it's can't touch this. God is good. Let's close singing of Jesus' nature. Let's close our time singing Love Came Down at Christmas. Let's close with a blessing. Lord Jesus Christ, touch our lives by your grace and help us to live and work for you always to your glory. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all and those whom we love now and evermore. Amen. Have a good week, folks, and a happy new year when it comes. And just think about the gift we've received, Jesus Christ. God go with you. Bye now.